Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And September is Library Card Sign Up Month. And so this week, our librarians are going to be sharing books that we love that have libraries or librarians in them. As you're listening, if you would like to get your hands on any of these books, or if you do need to sign up for a library card, the first way to go about doing that would be to contact your local branch of the Monroe County Library System and just give them a call. You could also request any of the titles that we talk about through our, our catalog online, and that would be for physical copies, hardcovers, paperbacks, an audiobook on CD, large print, um, and the address for that is on your screen right now. Some of the titles are also available digitally, and we have three different platforms that offer digital versions of titles. The first one you may hear referred to as either Overdrive or Libby. Libby is the app for Overdrive. And Overdrive offers ebooks and audiobooks. Hoopla offers ebooks, downloadable audiobooks, and also movies, music, and graphic novels. And RB Digital offers downloadable audiobooks and also magazines, week long passes to Acorn TV and the great courses. And the extra special thing about Hoopla and RB Digital is that anything that you see on those platforms never has a wait. If you see it, you can download it right then. This week, we have four of us here who are going to be talking about books with libraries or librarians. So we're going to introduce ourselves and our introduction question this week is to share one of your favorite stories that either happens in a library or involves a librarian. So my name is Jennifer Grineski. I am the community librarian at the Dundee Branch Library. And the story I'm going to share is a fairly funny one. And I think it's cute. So I was out working in the stacks at the Dundee Library and I overheard a mom and a son talking and the boy I would guess was anywhere from like four to five and he looked at mom and said mom mom I have to go to the bathroom and she was looking at the books and she said okay that's fine you can go ahead and go and then he wandered off and was gone for a few minutes and he came back and and looked at mom and said I went and she goes oh okay did you wash your hands no, there's no sink. She kind of looked at him funny and she's like, honey, what do you mean there's no sink? Just you couldn't get the water to work? And you, no, I went outside. I didn't know where the bathroom was. <laughs> so I don't know where this young boy ended up finding a place for himself outside. But yeah, he, he you know, he didn't know where the restroom was and he knew that that was, you know, a reasonably safe place to go apparently. So that's my fun library story that I overheard and I thought it was super cute because that poor mom, <laughs> as any mom would be, was utterly mortified, you know, and she's just like, you did what? <laughs> what did you do? But, um, but, you know, his trip to the library was fine, you know, he did what he needed to do. So that's my fun library story. Also with us this week, we have Kelly Vignier, who is the branch technician at the South Rockwood Library. And what fun library related story do you have for us, Kelly? <clears throat> I couldn't think of a specific one, so I was going to share a memory, but really quick, that kid's going to be really embarrassed when he <laughs> goes on his school <laughs> tour and the children's librarian says, and the most important part of the library is knowing where the bathrooms are. That was one of the <laughs> things that I always told my kids when they came into the library. Yes. So um, being in the library for 20 years, there's so many different um, stories that I could tell, but I was going to do a childhood memory um, of going to the library. We had the opportunity to uh, live closely to our local library, which was the Carlton branch, when I was younger and so um, I have lots of memories of my mom and my sister and I walking up to the Carlton branch to check out books and um, I love to tell kids too now that are so you know everything is electronic back in my day when you went down <laughs> to the library you had to take out the big long card catalog drawers and you had to go through all the cards and you know, too, I also tell kids this, you had to fill out a form of the books that you were checking out with the barcode. Um, and so I like telling those memories to kids, especially now blows their mind because they're like, what? It's not digital. Like you had to do stuff. Yeah, you did. And it was a lot of work and it it stunk. But, uh, <laughs> but at the end, had to work to get your 
it was worth it. It was worth the work, you know, so um, I like telling those stories. So those are my favorite um, childhood memories and ones that I think I will keep, you know, on my life because now working in a library, everything is digital and electronic and instantly gratifying. Um, it's fun to be have those stories now like grown ups that we had, you know, growing up like, oh, back in my day for real. Now I have a back in my day story. <laughs> A, a back in my day library. Story. Exactly. Even better. All right, thank you. We also have with us this week Marcia Lingendurfer, who is a reference librarian at the Bedford branch. What's your library story, Marcia? Um, my answer is very similar to Kelly's. I, I was going to tell, a, you know, we could have a lot of crazy stories and be here all day, but I decided to pick my earliest memory too. Unlike Kelly, I live out in the country, out in the middle of nowhere, and never even knew we had a library and had never visited one. However, um, my mother was best friends with Janet Kish, shout out to Janet Kish, who was a former um, library employee, and she drove the bookmobile. So the original, well, not the original, but the bookmobile that was around when I was a little girl, and she would come to my church so my mom would go down there. My mom just wanted to visit with her because my mom isn't visiting a library. So she would visit with her friend and I would get to go to a library and Janet would specifically pick out books that she thought I would like and bring them. So I think that was my very first love of the library and the experience and it was on wheels. And so I loved when the bookmobile came back because it was so special to me and it got me exposure to the library like it still does in some kids in the community. So shout out to Janet Kish and um, my early love of the library. Thank you, Marcia. Yay, Bookmobile. And we also have with us this week Jen McCarty, who is a reference librarian at the Ellis Library. And what's your library related story? I could tell a fun, like when I was a kid story. I live close to Dorsch, so I can remember going to Dorsch. And now, like looking back, um, I think I was probably a very annoying, like, teenager because I can remember walking there at like 13, 14, and like, you know, Looking at bridal magazines of all things, that was that was my <laughs> that was my deal at the time. Pretty dresses, pretty dresses. I, my cousin and I used to plan out our wedding. I'm gonna wear this dress, and I'm gonna <laughs> register for this thing. It was weird, but <laughs> and it turned out just like that too, exactly. right? That's who I am. <laughs> I want to share a behind the scenes sort of shenanigans that librarians get up to that you might not be aware of story. So a couple of years ago, when the first Fantastic Beasts movie came out. We had a party here at Ellis, and part of the party was um, we had a guy named Nelson who some of you might be familiar with Nelson. It's the animal safari, wildlife, whatever. He brings in animals, so he brought our beasts to the wild beast party. And it was really cool. We had a ton of people. It was great. He brought all these cool animals. And when it was done, we're cleaning up. All the patrons are gone. It's just some library people left in the building. He's got this. Um, trying to remember exactly what she is, a lynx named Elsa. And he goes, oh, go ahead and close those doors. I'll let her out. <laughs> so he okay. let this huge cat out of her cage in our programming room here at Ellis. And she immediately dives underneath the chairs that we've been putting away like a house cat. And my whole thought is, oh my God, the cat's going to pee in here and I'm going to have to explain why I have big cat pee smell in the <laughs> library. So she's hiding, seriously, like a house cat. And we're all kind of going, oh crap, what do we do now? <laughs> so he ends up saying, okay, I need a volunteer. Can one of you just kind of walk out in the middle of the room? She's really playful. And if you turn your back to her, she's going to pounce on you. <laughs> So that seems like a good idea. Yeah, I, there was yeah, so many sure. I am. I'm getting fired. I'm going to jail. <laughs> I'm going to have to pay to replace the carpet. Um, <laughs> luckily, she did not pee. No, she did not maul anybody. But we did have uh, Cheryl, who works here at Ellis, volunteered to walk out into the middle of the room, turned her back on the cat, and she did. She launched out from under these chairs, and he like tackled her, <laughs> like. I mean, he was treating her like a kitten and we're all going, this is a really big cat. Um, <laughs> so sometimes when you are when you come to a library program and you've had a great time and you leave, we're cleaning up and we might also almost get mauled by a lynx. <laughs> <laughs> Things so that, that happen at the, the library. <laughs> that's the fun behind the scenes shenanigans that librarians get up to. <laughs> Gotta keep your eye on librarians. We are, we're crazy. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Good times. 
All right, now we're going to go ahead and share books that have libraries or librarians in them. And let's have Marsha start with her titles. OK, I picked a couple of um, younger books today. These are books that I go, um, I read whenever I go into classes and into schools. And um, these are two of my favorites. I love Madeline Finn and the Library Dog. Um, I love this book for so many reasons. I love the story. It's perfect for reluctant readers. Um, she does not, she has a hard time reading and she stammers and she finds um, she has a personal connection with a librarian like so many kids do who gives her the idea. And I also love the illustration. I was just going to show a few. She gives her this idea to come to the program and to read to a dog, to read to Bonnie. Oh, you even have the pages up. That's great. And so she reads to this dog and I always tell the kids, you know, if you don't have a dog, you can read this stuffed animal. And, you know, kids are always like, I read to my cat. I read to my dog. And so, um, there's really a, a cute surprise at the end that I'm not going to ruin. It's a wonderful book to read. But one of the things, um, and right, not currently, because we currently are not having programs in the building at the library, but one of the reasons I love to read this book is at the Bedford branch, we do a program called PAWS, P-A-W-S, PAWS for reading, where you can actually come and read to the library dogs, the trained um, dogs. So I love it when I get to that page and tell the kids you can come do that at the library because they are just like, when, when, sign me up. So I love this book for multiple reasons. I love that I can promote a program. I love that I can encourage kids to read and it's just a great story. So Madeline Finn and the Library Dog is one that I love and I frequently read um, in inside of classrooms. And um, that was my first selection. And then my second one is a similar along those lines. I actually think, Kelly, you were the one who told me to read this one. Um, the Mr. Uh, Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's Library, I believe, was um, Kelly who inspired me to read this one. And similar reasons, we've also done programming in the past where this book is amazing. This book is great. These are a group of kids that um, are figuring out clues and playing games. And they're, it's just this really super fun book and a super fun um, program as well. And we've done those in the library. So I always encourage kids, if you liked, you know, 39 clues or if you, you know, if you just like a good um, kind of a mystery, fun game playing book, it's, it's all about the games and getting through it um, in a light and fun way, not in a Hunger Games sort of way. But it's very, uh, it's, a, it's a very entertaining read. And again, both of these books I love because I can tie them into programming at the library. And then I can also just encourage kids who maybe don't love to read. These are both wonderful books for reluctant readers as well. So those are the two that I picked for today, kind of a one for the younger kids and then one maybe for your tweens or teens as well or grownups. <laughs> The Lemon Cello books I love because they're a series and there's like tons of them now in the series, but I also love them because they teach the kids the different aspects of the library, the nonfiction, the fiction, the audiobooks. like it, it's such a great fun book and the story behind it is really cool too. The premise, you know, they, they don't have a library. These kids have never experienced a library and I always think about that. Like what if we didn't have libraries, right? Like what would, what would kids do? Like it's such a sad thing and I've even asked my kids who are nine and seven and say like what would you do like if you didn't have a library and my seven-year-old was like my heart would be so sad <laughs> but i always think about that like i can't imagine growing up and not having access to books like a library right. yeah and it always box. reminds me of kind of going to willy wonka's chocolate factory because they had that whole awe yeah. experience you know in this one as well but yes. yeah i i love this book and kelly you're the one who turned me on to it i believe or even jennifer you guys were the ones who are like you have to read this so i've been reading it ever since so thanks for the inspiration yeah, I haven't read them yet, but my son has read all of them. And the most recent one is Mr. Lemoncello and the Titanium Ticket. And that just came out this month. So <laughs> I haven't read those either. Age range. Anybody? Oh. Um, I'd say fifth and up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fifth grade and up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Always looking for stuff either for I don't know. Tony was reading them as soon as he could read chapter like, books. Family. Yeah. yeah. This yeah, would be a good one for that, Jen. Family. A family out loud book for sure independently fifth grade but it would really be a great family one because he he also references a lot of um juvenile and easy picture books in there too oh, cool. so it'd be really cool as a family to say oh we read this book remember this book or oh we should put this on our to read list um it, it would be a really good family read aloud book good to know and the most recent one <laughs> again i haven't read it going on the word of my 11 year old but the most recent one, apparently there's a contest that Chris Grabenstein, the author, has put together to find all of the names of board games that are referenced in the most recent book. 
And so I got home from work and my kid already had started his list. He's like, they're supposed to be over 60. And I've only got, I don't know how many he had. He had like 25 or 30 that he could think of. So he's combing back through the book, looking for any words that are also board game names. That's so <laughs> fun little puzzles and things in there yeah. too. It's super fun. And we did a program when I did it um, in Dundee with the fourth and fifth grade classes. They read them and um, we actually did the game in the library. There's a game that Chris Grabenstein and I'm sure his publishers um, created for librarians to do in the library for the kids to kind of get a, the concept of a library and how it works. Like the Dewey Decimal System, you know, can be overwhelming at sometimes. So um, that is that that book is awesome. Connecting kids to the library. Very cool. Thank you, Marcia. And let's have Jen share her library reads next. OK, so um, my two, the first one I'm going to talk about is Ink and Bone by Rachel Kane. It's the first book in the Great Library uh, series. I think there are five now. So this is set in a um, alternative world where the great Alexander, the great library of Alexandria has not been destroyed. And so through that, um, it becomes the great library with a capital L who kind of controls all of the knowledge in the world. So librarians are almost like this overarching um, kind of a governmental agency. Personal books are not allowed. We're not allowed to own our own books. Oh, he's, he, he disappeared. Um, so people have basically like a tablet kind of device that they call a blank and you can still read stuff, but it has to be approved by the Great Library. So the main character's name is Jess, uh, Jess Brightwell, and his family are book smugglers. So um, he's grown up in this sort of underworld, you know, illegal book smuggling business because you're not allowed to own paper original copies and his family does that, and, but he loves books. Um, and he's not really sure if he wants to continue on the family business. And his dad's like, well, you're not selling us out. So uh, why don't you go to work for the library? So he gets him to take an entrance test. He's going to try to work for the library. Just gets selected. So he's one of 30 students who are vying for six positions within the library. And his family wants him to get the job to be a spy because the librarians are also the people that police um, book ownership. It's kind of a it, it, this it's a really weird mix of stuff because it's kind of got a little bit of a dystopian flair, but it's kind of futuristic. Like there's all this tech um, there. They have what they call automatons that um, like patrol for books. It's weird. Like your one thing that's outlawed is basically books. Um, and so Jess and his fellow recruits kind of stumble into a mix. Oh, we may have momentarily lost Jen. Gonna give it a minute, see if she comes back. <laughs> She's gonna like that. <laughs> or Jennifer, you could start and go. We can oh, go back. Right. So I guess um, we'll have Kelly start talking. Let me get, go for it, Kelly, and we'll bounce back to Jen and Ink and Bone. All right then. So um, the first book that I'm going to talk about is a YA book called The Chosen One. And um, this book really stuck with me after I read it. Anyone who knows me knows that I don't follow the news because if I find a story that is um, depressing or um, haunting, it will haunt me forever and I research the junk out of it. So um, during a time, um, I don't know, it was years ago in Texas they disbanded that polygamous cult commune um, and it was really intense well this book came around shortly after that and um, the main character uh, Kira is 13 almost 14 years old and she lives in a polygamous compound um, she's never questioned her life before her her father has three wives she has 20 brothers and sisters completely normal until one day as she's on her walk like she usually is she catches sight of a truck driving down the road and makes eye contact with the driver it's a library um, truck it's the iron ironting county library on wheels 
and she makes connection, eye connection with them, and she's intrigued. Um, so she goes back every day uh, for three weeks to figure out the schedule and figures out what day he's he's going to be there. So he stops the one time and says, "You it looks like you need a library card. And she's terrified because her whole life she's been taught you don't read anything but the Bible. Those are the demon's words. So she says, um, yeah, OK. And he says, well, you can check out up to four books. And she says, um, I'll just take the one because in her head, one is easier to hide than four. Um, the thing that has always stayed with me with this book, I mean, there's lots of things that have happened that stay with me, but this whole scene of her explaining her situation with this librarian and their meeting always sticks with me. She says when she walks onto the truck, the sight of all the books in there makes her tear up. She's just overwhelmed with the amount of materials that are in this truck. Um, she takes one book. The book that he recommends to her is The Bridge of Terabithia, and he says, um, the girl at my last stop really loved it. I've read it and she's so confused. The girl at his last stop and he's read this book. So she takes it home and she can't read it fast enough. And she's so overwhelmed with the sadness and the happiness. And who are these characters and what are these sinful words? And how does are these people the writer knows? And she's she can't read it fast enough and she can't get back to the library on wheels fast enough to get her next book. After her initial meeting with the bookmobile, she finds out that she has been chosen um, by God to be a wife to one of the pro one of the apostles to the prophet. The prophet is, you know, the all seeing um, boss of the commune. Um, here's the thing. The apostle is 50 years her senior and is also her uncle. So after this, she is absolutely devastated because she's not obviously in love with her uncle. Um, her parents are against it and they try to go to the prophet to appeal it but it, with no avail um, but she's really in love with a 16 year old um, named Joshua who also lives on the compound he goes and asks for her hand in marriage um, from the prophet and it comes out that they've been sneaking around together and so she is considered an adulteress and um, things unfold from there and get worse and the librarian who drives the library bus notices at her weekly visits that something's not quite right. Um, so he tells her, if you ever need a ride anywhere, I am here for you and I will take you out of here. When he says this, um, someone from the God Squad comes onto the truck and he hides her until he leaves. Things get worse. She's trying to figure out what she's gonna do. She has four weeks till she marries her uncle when things get really bad and she decides to take Patrick up on his offer. And so Patrick takes her in the library um, van and tries to escape with her. Um, I'm not going to tell you what happens, but um, you know, this whole story, first the whole polygamous thing aside is very fascinating. Um, but then to have this girl who has this connection with a librarian really, really stuck with me because you don't know in this profession, a lot of people think, oh yeah, sure, you're checking books in and out, but it's so much more than that. Like on, on every different level, as a, as a children's person, as a, somebody who works with adults, like for some people, we could just be that person that they see all day long. And so we are that connection and that, you know, that human interaction. And for kids, we could be the safe place where they come and are able to tell things to or their escape into books. Um, so this story has always stuck with me. So I was um, pretty excited to be able to talk about it today. So um, read the book. It has it, it's sad. It's heartbreaking, but it also has a very good ending. So, you know. I'm not going to leave you guys hanging with some depressing stuff. Um, <laughs> the next book um, I have is Miss Brooks Loves Bro Books and I Don't. I love this book. So my mom actually got this book for me and inscribed it and said, you know, to my Miss to my very own Miss Brooks, um, your passion of love of reading or something like that. Um, this book I love and I used to read it at all my school visits. So Miss Brooks is a school librarian and she loves books so much, so much so that she dresses up in costumes and it's just overwhelming for this little girl who is the main character. I mean, she's sure that her costumes itch and what's the point? I mean, it's just so vexing. Well, <laughs> May comes and it's 
um, book week and everyone has to pick out a book that they love and they have to um, bring it to the class and she wants them to find a book and read it and love it as much as she does. Well, the main character is like, that's never going to happen because I hate reading. And so my favorite, my favorite part of the book, she goes home to her mother and she says, when I get home, I ask my mother if we can move to a new town. And my mother says, there's a librarian in every town. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite line. And so the week goes on and everyone is bringing their books about princesses and cowboys and trains and it's too yippity and too flowery. And so her Mrs. Miss Brooks is giving her all these books to take home to her mother and her mother and she says to her mother, I just I'm never going to like reading the way that she does. And her mother says, you're as stubborn as a war. And she's like, warts. I could get on board with that. <laughs> she finds a book about warts and this um ogre shrek who is um revolting and he finds himself a revolting bride and they're snorting and warts and it's just amazing and so she ends up reading this book over and over again and she cuts out warts for her for her classmates and it's amazing and miss brooks says at the end she's glad that i found a book i love and i she says that even ogres like me can find something funny and fantastic and appalling at the library and that's the slimy truth and so i i love reading that to kids because i i can't tell you how many kids have said well i hate reading i hate books no you don't you just haven't found the book that you like and there is always something slimy and fantastic and appalling for anyone to like <laughs> I love that description. I know, right? It's true. <laughs> it's the best. It's the best. So the next book I'm going to talk about is also another one of my favorites that I would read. Um, oh, P.S. For those of you who are just tuning in, I used to be a youth technician at the Dundee <laughs> Library for 13 years. So that's why I say to my kids or my school kids, because that used to be a thing. Um, <clears throat> so this book I also would read um, to the kids when they came in because um, I just love the stories and the pictures. And this book is fairly lengthy, but I'm gonna tell you, the kids are so tunnel visioned into this book and are so captured by the illustrations and the words, it always blows my mind. Preschoolers up, like everyone loves this book. So um, a little bit of a backstory. The author, um, Michelle Knudsen, she, as a child, remembers walking by the New York City Library on 42nd Street, and her dad pointed out the um, lion statues that sit in on the stairs um, at the entrance of the library. And she was so entranced and enchanted by these statues, it stuck with her for the longest time when she became a grown up. Um, she still had that connection of the lions and their um, protectiveness and their welcomingness and the magic of the libraries. The Stone Guardians, they're so welcoming and their presence to whoever enters that she had to write about it. And so she said it only made sense to make the lion the main character of her book. So the library lion is a story about a lion who wanders into the library and there's um, a clerk who works at the desk and um, runs to the librarian and says, Miss Merriweather, there's a lion in the library. And she says, well, is he breaking any rules? And Mr. Mippy says, well, no. And she says, well, if he's not breaking any rules, then he's fine. So the lion goes over to story hour, listens to story hour. Story hour is over. The lion starts roaring because he's so upset that the story hour is over and he wanted more stories and it was fantastic. So Miss Merriweather comes out and says, you need to leave. You cannot roar in the library because the library is a quiet place. And the kids say, well, if, if the lion promises not to roar anymore, can he stay? Of course, he can come back tomorrow. So the lion does. He comes back every single day. And as the days go on, he becomes a library helper. He helps stamp or lick the envelopes for the overdue notices. He helps um, miss or the children reach the very high shelves. Um, and he's just a very comforting presence in the library. One day, the lion is with Mrs. Mary, Miss, Miss Merriweather in her, the back room, and she is reaching for a book on a very high shelf, and she reaches a little too high and falls and breaks her arm. Miss Merriweather tells the lion, please go get Mr. McBee. So Mr. McBee, who has, you know, he's not a real big fan of the lion because he's taken all the attention, and you know, lion shouldn't be in the library. He's at the desk, and when the lion comes to the desk, he, the lion's looking at him like, hey man, there's some trouble over here, but Mr. McBee tells him to scram, so the lion roars. And Mr. McBee says, you broke the rules, and he runs down the hallway to be a tattletale to Miss Merriweather. 
that's when he finds Miss Weariweather on the floor. And when they both go back out to find the lion, the lion is gone because the lion broke the rules. So the lion doesn't come back the next day or the day after that or the day after that. And Miss Merriweather is heartbroken because she needs the lion more than ever now. So Mr. McBee sets out to find the lion and he does find the lion and he says to the lion, there's a good reason to break the rules even in the library. <clears throat> And so the lion comes back and everyone's happy and throwing papers in the air. Um, <laughs> so I love this book because, you know, the library is so many people look at the library as a shh, quiet place. Shh, don't talk. But our libraries are commu they're community libraries, right? We have story times, we have groups, we have crafts, we have movies, we have programming. So it's a community librarian. And so even though the library should be a fun, safe, quiet place, only sometimes because it's okay to break the rules in the library sometimes. That's I all. just love that. I love <laughs> that book and I love the illustrations and I love that one of the lion that was up earlier listening to the story because you can see his shoulders move forward like he's so <laughs> into the story. Mm -hmm. I just I just love all the illustrations. They're all really well done. And like I said, it's a lengthy book and I don't know if it's the way that it's read through or what, but every kid is just totally enraptured by this lion and his story and breaking the rules and what's going to happen. Like it always, it always fascinated me, the kids that would just like immediately stop and listen to that story. Thank you, Kelly. And now Jen is back with us. Hey, Jen. Yay. So we're going to go back to Ink and Bone <laughs> with Jen. And My internet cut out. I'm back. <laughs> We're glad. Like, technical difficulties. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um. Pretty much wrapped up in Cambone. It's really fun. It's kind of a a different take on libraries because the libraries are kind of the bad guy, which is not something we normally you know deal with. Um. But so that one, that's that one. My next book is called Libriomancer, and it's by Jim C. Hines. Um, a couple of fun things about this one. It, the author is from Michigan. It's oh. set in Michigan. So um, if you are, a, you know, a Michigander and you're reading this, there's a lot of a lot of Michigan locations. He starts off in the UP. He ends up in the Lower Peninsula. Um, he goes to Detroit. I think they're going to Marquette at one point. I think he goes to Michigan State at one point. So that's kind of fun, like all the Michigan stuff. So the main character's name is Isaac Viano. He's a he's a what's called a libriomancer, which basically is somebody who gets their magic from books. Um, so he is part of a group called. Let me let me see if I can get the German right. The Dieswelf Portenaire or the Porters, um, and they're basically magic librarians. So when the book starts, Isaac is working in the Copper River Public Library in the UP, and he's just a regular kind of librarian. Um, he's still doing some stuff for the porters, but he has not actively used magic in several years. Um, the only sort of link he still has to that magic world is he has a magic spider named Smudge, who's a fire spider, and when he's nervous or um, scared, he sets himself on fire, which is just fun. Smudge is a fun character. So this world, so the porters, what they can do, is they can pull things from books. So, hey, I find myself in need of a sword. Oh, let me grab King Arthur and I can pull out Excalibur. They can actually physically reach into the book and pull out the object. I need to sneak. Where's Harry Potter? I'm going to get myself an invisibility cloak. But the flip side to this is um, because books are magic, anything that has very strongly held beliefs can come to life. So, there are other things that have come out of books, maybe accidentally or just because they have such powerfully held beliefs. So the porters are sort of there to um, police the rest of us mortals and sort of keep us safe from the bad things that might come out of books. And immediately in the beginning of this book, um, Isaac finds himself attacked by vampires. And I, I want to read a little bit because it's really, I think it's funny. So I wanted to share a couple little bits here. As she pulled away, I spotted three people approaching the library. 
They were dressed far too warmly for June, even in the UP. They kept their heads down and their hands in their pockets. I locked the door, though. If Smudge was right, that probably wouldn't help. The trio stopped to study the address of the post office across the street. One reached into her pocket and pulled out a crumpled piece of paper. Her hand glittered like a disco ball in the afternoon sun as she scanned the buildings. She tucked her sleeve over her hand a second later, but that one glimpse was enough to identify them as swang Sanguinarius Mayari, formerly known as Sparklers. <laughs> it's the Twilight Vampires. Twilight Vampires. Uh, Twilight became, you know, got so popular, the vampires were able to come out. And then a couple of pages later, I enjoy... Nice. Um, uh, back in the days of Dracula, humans had a fighting chance against the undead, but the more they evolved from monsters into angsty, sexy superheroes, the more the odds of a human being surviving an encounter with an angry vampire shrank to nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> the things that come out of books retain whatever their bookish thing is. So, like, Bram Stoker's Draculas are, you know, garlic and steaks. Twilight vampires sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, they have less of those sort of um, the weaknesses. So it's a really, really fun book. Um, it's There's references to a lot of popular books, obviously, like Twilight. Um, there's references to some fake books. One of the other main characters is, um, a, is a dryad who's been pulled out of a fake like science fiction-y fantasy novel. Um, so it's it's really kind of a love letter to books and the magic that is books, but in this world they literally can come to life with magic, um, and it's really really fun. And I I love that it's set in Michigan and there's all these little connections to Michigan there too. So, Libro Mancers is a fun fun book. That one sounds fun, and it's a Michigan exactly. magical Michigan librarians. Yes, and he's in. Isaac is a really fun character because, like I said, in the beginning, he hasn't used magic in a long time. And, of course, there's a reason for that. And, you know, we got to find it out. Um, but he gets sucked right back into it. And you've got this, you know, funny sidekick in his fire, fire spider. It's hard to say. Smudge. Um, and yeah, the vampires that are funny because you've got the different breeds of vampires in the different books. And then there's other magical things. And it's just, it's just fun. It's a lot of fun. Good times. Thanks, Jen. Uh, my library related titles. The first one is one that we did for book club, and this was supposed to be the book that we were going to discuss in April of this year. And, you know, then things happen. So we didn't get to talk about this one, but it's so good. So my first one is The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek by Kim Michelle Richardson. And the main character of this, the book woman, is Cussie Carter. It is 1936, and she is working for the Works Progress Administration as a mule librarian in Kentucky. And she is also the last living female of the rare blue people who live in Kentucky and Appalachia. And the blue people actually have a genetic, I don't know what you would call it, but due to genetics, their skin appears blue and she can actually blush and she'll blush bluer and most of the time it's kind of a bluey gray and i did go out as a librarian does and research this and yes this is a real thing um and you can see pictures of them and there's all sorts of you know um history books and interesting information about the blue people of kentucky because she is blue she is clearly not white. And so the people of Kentucky in 1936 don't really know what to do with her. Um, unfortunately, her supervisor for the Works Progress Administration that makes sure the books are coming in and that they're going out to the different people she's taking them to considers her as less than because her skin is a different color she is treated as less than white. Um, and some of the people on her route also treat her that way, while others treat her as a human being who is bringing them the books that they want and who is helping them in a lot of other ways too. Her dad is a coal miner, and of course things are, 
coal mining is struggling at this time. He's also part of the union that they're trying to get started. So he's also seen as a bit of a troublemaker and he's actually also quite ill with what is most likely black lung from being a coal miner for so many years. So he is really hoping that he can get Cussie married. Um, he does his best. Cussie gets in a relationship, things go wrong, and drama pursues. Um, there's relationship drama, there's drama from the fact that she is treated as other in her community. There's um, a family that really dislikes her family. Um, there's, there's a lot happening. It feels like every page, something new is going on. Um, so if you like history, it's there. If you like action, it's there. If you like a little bit of romance, it's there. Um, it's a re it's just a really good story. And while we didn't get to meet as a book club to talk about it, I've seen some of my book club attendees through curbside service and every single one of them said, we've got to meet sometime. You know, we got to talk about this book next year. Whenever we meet next, we need to talk about this one. So if you like historical fiction, you like good reads that just move right along and you like to learn a little something along with it, this is a good one to pick up. Pick up the book, Woman of Troublesome Creek. The other book I'm gonna talk about is The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. Erin Morgenstern is best known as the author of The Night Circus. And The Night Circus seems to be a very love it or hate it sort of book. You either really love it, which I did, or you're really like, I don't get this at all. I don't see the point. Why are we going to, I don't, I don't know what's going on. If you are one of those people who is like, I really didn't like the Night Circus, do not pick up the Starless Sea because you are not, it's not gonna change. She, her writing style is the same. She creates magical worlds. Um, and I think you will feel the same way about it. So the Starless Sea, is this world that exists far beneath the surface of the earth and on the shores of the starless sea there's this labyrinth of tunnels that are filled with stories and these stories might be just two lines long they might be huge tomes they might be quilted they could be written in all sorts of different languages but all of these stories are stored in these tunnels in the Starless Sea. And down here in these tunnels, there's a whole nother world going on. And there's a group of people that are supposed to be protecting the Starless Sea. But as usual, if we go back to our George Orwell, power corrupts. And so these people that are supposed to be protecting this world end up just wanting to keep it hidden and keep their power. So that's going on in the Starless Sea. Up here in the real world is Zachary Ezra Rollins, who wanders into his local library, picks out a book because he just needs something to read because he's real tired from college and all the stuff that's going on in his life. And he starts reading the book and the first story in the book describes him doesn't name him, but describes him as a child walking past this wall that has a door painted on it. And then it describes him actually going over to it and opening the door and entering this world of the Starless Sea. And Zachary reads that and he remembers that moment, but he didn't open the door in real life, but he remembers thinking that he should. So you have this going on where Zachary's like, what's going on? The book has some information in it. He talks to the librarian. How did the book get added to the collection? Why is this story about me that nobody else would know about in here? So he's exploring all of that. You got the Starless Sea going on. And then you get random snippets throughout the book of stories that you have no idea how they're related to anything else. You just got to go with it. By the end of the book, it all ties together, but it doesn't feel like it's going to while you're reading, because you're just like, what is this for? The closest thing that I could describe it to is um, because Zachary's 
and I didn't know this was a thing, but apparently at college he's studying gaming theory. Um, so if you are a video gamer or um, an intense board game player, more like Dungeons and Dragons, not like, sorry, but intense board game player, like there's a lot of role playing games out there. The way this book is put together reminds me of that. Because if you've played a classic puzzle computer game like Myst, or um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that are out there, but basically you're just dropped into the middle of this game and you have no idea what's going on. You're just exploring the world and trying to make connections about what's happening. That's how this book is written. It is not linear. So you have to be willing to just go with it. And the worlds that she creates are amazing. I'm like, I could visit there. You feel like you're there. But if nonlinear, magical worlds without a lot of quick explanation is not your thing, don't pick this book up. But if I could visit the Starless Sea, it would be amazing. So that is the Starless Sea by Aaron Morgan Stern. And I would anytime Aaron Morgan Stern writes something, I'm gonna pick it up. I will say I if you love, love the Night Circus. Yes, if you love the Night Circus, I think you're still that's still probably gonna be your favorite of the two books that she's released. But I think if you love the Night Circus, this one is worth picking up for the world creation that she does. I've checked it out like four times and just haven't. It's thick. It's a big book. Yeah, I and debated like talking about this one about last week books, when we I just went, oh, I don't know that I want to do this right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, one a of, um, it's a commitment. One of the other librarians here at Ellis just finished The Starless Sea and um, she was reading something else and she said, I'm having such a hard time with this book because this one is so like short, the new book. She's like, it's short and it's to the point. And the Starless Sea is so lyrical and you get so invested. She's like, I think I need a minute. I think I need a minute and I can't read something else right now. I can understand that. The Starless Sea is kind of its own trippy experience. If you yeah. like books that are very plot driven, straightforward, that's not the Starless Sea. It's very much immersive and you just got to go with it. <laughs> and we do have a couple of bonus books this week because both Jen and I had books on our list that were just released in August that we haven't had a chance to read, but that we both think are sound like amazing reads. So if you're interested in them, get your name on the list early. Um, we're gonna give you just a real brief synopsis of each of them. Um, mine is The Lions of Fifth Avenue. And um, Kelly mentioned earlier, with the um, library lion, how it's based on the two stone lions outside the New York Public Library. Uh, Patience and Fortitude are their names. Uh, the Lions of Fifth Avenue is a reference to that. Um, it's got two plot lines. The first one takes place in the past when the superintendent of the New York Public Library actually lived in an apartment with his family in the New York Public Library, which that sounds like a dream come true. And this this plot line focuses on the wife and she is trying to decide whether or not to go to journalism school. She's trying to decide how satisfied she is with her life as a wife and a mother and whether or not she wants to explore different possibilities. And while she is doing this, some important manuscripts from the library go missing. So that's that plot line. And then the other one takes place years later and appears to be about her granddaughter who now works for the New York Public Library and is putting together an exhibit. And while she is working on this exhibit, again, some manuscripts go missing. And as she's trying to figure out what has happened, she starts looking into her family's past with the New York Public Library. And as usual, there are secrets that are revealed through her explorations of her family's past. So that is the Lions of Fifth Avenue. It sounds amazing. I'm on the list for it. Uh, according to the sticker on it, it was also a Good Morning America book club choice, and it was just released on August 5th. I know there's a waiting list for that one. So if you want it, make sure to call your local library and get yourself on the list. 
And then Jen's going to talk about our other recent library related release. So if you have um, been following along with literary libations, you've heard us mention Meg Cabot several times. You've also heard us mention the book that this uh, follows. So the first book in the um, the Little Bridge Island is what the series is going to be called is um, No Judgments. And I book talked it once and uh, Stephanie, who is not with us today, also talked about it once. So this book takes place on Little Bridge Island, which is an island in the Florida Keys. Um, it doesn't have the same characters as the other book, so if you haven't read No Judgments, no big deal. Um, it's like it's in the same world, but they don't, you don't need to read, they're standalone, you don't need to read the other one. This one follows Molly, who is a brand new children's librarian. She has moved to Little Bridge from Colorado, kind of trying to start over, so she moves out of town. Um, she's the new children's librarian, and she's a little bit quirky, a little bit crazy. Um, and a baby is abandoned in the library or possibly abandoned or they find a baby or something. There's something with a baby. <laughs> and so she has to get the local sheriff involved. And the sheriff is a newly divorced single father. He's a little bit grumpy. She's a little bit quirky. And of course, some sparks fly. So um, I've read some reviews on this one and it's, it seems to be really mixed. A lot of people are like not loving Molly as a character. Um, but I love Meg Cabot. It's set, it's set in a library. I really liked the Little Bridge world, so I'm really excited for this one. I did. Um, I'm on. I was on the waiting list for Overdrive Libby, and I just it just came in for me, and I haven't had a chance to start it yet. But I'm excited about it, and I can't wait to get to it because I love Meg Cabot, and I think this one is going to be fun. Yay! Thank you. And those are our library or librarian related reads. Thank you to all of you for sharing. Next week, we are going to be talking about books that take us back to school. So whether they're set in a school or they remind you of books that you read when you were in school, what, however we decide to interpret that, but books that take you back to school. That's what we'll be discussing next week. Thank you to everybody who listened. Thanks again to our participants, and we hope you have a great week. Bye. <laughs>